Dear ladies and gentlemen, let, let us start our uh, online meeting. Uh, first of all, uh, let me first extend our best uh, wishes to our friends and uh, colleagues in attendance. Thank you for coming to listen and take part in our discussion on the ways uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is impacting the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative in Central Asia. My name is Ermek Baisalov. I'm the editor of uh, analytical platform Kabar.Asia. Uh, today, I will serve as a moderator of this event, along with my colleague, uh, Nargiza Muratalieva. Uh, first, let me brief you, briefly tell about our uh, analytical uh, platform, the Central Asian uh, Bureau of Analytical Reporting, which we uh, shortly call uh, Kabar.Asia, a uh, platform which is uh, meant to uh, provide uh, a forum for discussing and uh, reflecting on the uh, critical uh, political processes in the Central Asian region. At Kabar Asia, we uh, are interested in understanding not only the positions and uh, assessments of regional actors, uh, uh, but also those uh, of uh, international experts and organizations. Uh, Kabar.Asia is a project of the Institute of, uh, for War and Peace uh, Reporting, IWPR. It's an international network of uh, organizations which works in uh, 28 countries worldwide. So today um, at this meeting, uh, there is a leadership of our organization in the person of Mr. Uh, Anthony Borden. Uh, he's a IWPR executive director. And uh, Mr. Abahon Sultan Azarov, uh, Regional Director of uh, IWPR in Central Asia. And also with us today, uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Ole Bjornoy, uh, the Norwegian Ambassador to Central Asia. Uh, I would like to take this uh, opportunity and uh, to, to thank the government of uh, Norway for the opportunity to hold this meeting and uh, to support the, our activities. So as you already know, the topic uh, of uh, this meeting is the implementation of the Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative in the con context of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Today we will consider uh, issues such as uh, how the geopolitical changes can influence the uh, Belt and Road Initiative in Central Asia and uh, how the Chinese economic uh, ties influence the economic situation in Central Asia. Uh, is it uh, relevant to compare the political regimes in response to the pandemic? And uh, what are the new tools can, you, can uh, China use to promote its uh, soft power? So um, to this end, we have gathered an online forum today with an international contingent. We are greatly pleased to present uh, this panel, uh, which includes Mr. Uh, Arne Elias Carneliusen, the founder of and director of NRC, the Norwegian Risk Consulting International, a geopolitical risk advisory. Also, uh, Dr. Catherine Owen, uh, who is a British Academy postdoctoral uh, fellow and uh, lecturer in international relations at the University of Exeter. And Dr. Raman Vakulchuk, a senior research fellow at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Uh, together with these uh, international experts, we have the representatives of the Central Asia, uh, Mr. Anton uh, Bugayenka uh, the, from Kazakhstan, uh, who is a chief uh, expert uh, of the Chinese and Asian Studies program at the uh, Institute of uh, World uh, uh, Economics and Politics. And uh, Mr. Timur Umarov uh, from uh, Uzbekistan, who is a uh, Sinologist, uh, yeah, aspiring sinologist and a specialist in Central Asia uh, and who works as a consultant and a contributor to the Carnegie Moscow Center. So uh, let me uh, say a few words about the technical aspects of the today's meeting. Our discussion uh, is divided into four thematic uh, sessions. Each session has one uh, or two keynote speakers as well as a couple uh, commenters. The report uh, takes uh, 10 minutes and the comment uh, is uh, two, three minutes. One session lasts an average of 50 minutes. 
Uh, after these sessions, we will have a, a Q&A session, which will be in the end of the meeting. Uh, so the, uh, I would like to ask to post your questions here on uh, Zoom, as well as uh, uh, on the live on the Facebook. Questions should be as clear as possible, indicating the name of the person to whom the question is addressed. The moderator, me and the Nargiza, uh, will collect these uh, questions and uh, read them out. Uh, so these are the rules of our today's online meeting. The first speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Arne Cornelius. And, uh, dear Mr. Cornelius, and the floor is yours. Uh, the, the, you have uh, up to 10 minutes for your report. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes, we do. Thank you very much. Thank you, first of all, for the very kind invitation. I want to particularly thank uh, Abakon Sultanazarov and his team, uh, the Institute for War and Peace Reporting, and the State Relations Bureau for Analytical Reporting. I've been very much looking forward to this timely and important topic which we're going to discuss today. First of all, uh, in looking at my questions in my uh, theme, what, how geopolitical changes can influence BRI in Central Asia? Uh, what is the future for infrastructure projects and how will BRI and other geopolitical projects in Central Asia interact? Well, first of all, I want to say something which is, I think, the theme for my presentation, that, and that is that COVID-19 does not change the underlying strategic rationale for the One Belt, One Road strategy. In fact, COVID-19 will only cement and strengthen China's strategic rationale and willingness to push forward with a One Belt, One strategy in the long term. While we currently see turmoil because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we see macroeconomic challenges globally. Global energy markets are in turmoil. We are seeing major economic challenges in China. There have been challenges. Many companies collapsed. While China is now seeing a rebound economically and is going back, back to almost to normal, normal conditions, we are seeing Europe going through a lockdown period, the United States, North America, and may, almost the rest of the world basically being in lockdown. That will probably last for the next months or so, and different countries will open up at different points in time. What is important to mention is that the One Belt One Road projects that we see, and there are different projects. Now, the One Belt strategy, which is going from Western China, across Central Asia, Russia, South Asia, the Middle East, and to Europe, the projects that have stopped, that is because of countries are either in lockdown, or uh, basically there are not enough workers to continue with the projects, or because of financial challenges. That will continue for some time in the projects where we see companies collapse well then probably new companies will take over and when they have enough workers particularly also chinese workers that are technically skilled or in leadership positions in their various projects they will come back and continue the projects at different stages but overall the one belt one road strategy will continue russia currently is seeing an increase in covid 19 cases Therefore, Russia is currently going through a challenging period. However, what a lot of European and American journalists and analysts, I think, undermine is Russia's economic resilience. Russia has a stronger economy than I think a lot of analysts and journalists actually see. Therefore, Russia will also, after the COVID-19 pandemic, be able to come back and rebound. Because of Russia's historical links across Central Asia, naturally, and Russian language being the lingua franca in Central Asia, Russia's influence will continue despite China's infrastructure projects with the One Belt, One Road across Central Asia. Europe is cur currently going through a very challenging period with the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, European-Chinese relations post-COVID-19 will also, I think, go through various different stages. Fundamentally speaking, European-Chinese relations will continue, will stabilize over time, although there may be some diplomatic issues and there might be different questions and discussions arising about how the COVID-19 emerged, etc., etc. Fundamentally speaking, 
Chinese-European relations will continue, and the importance of the One Belt, One Road strategy also for Europe will rebound. And therefore, because of Central Asia's unique geographic epicenter pos position in the Eurasian continent, Central Asia is so important being between China, Russia, the Indian subcontinent, the Middle East, and Europe. Therefore, Central Asia is in many ways the important epicenter in the One Belt strategy because it borders the Western Chinese border. So that is actually an important point. Um, India currently is in lockdown. Uh, India's in a situation where it is challenging for India to build infrastructure across the borders because of challenging bilateral relations with Pakistan, with China, even with Bangladesh. So therefore, I think that uh, despite a desire for Russia to build infrastructure projects from the Arctic LNG projects to India to provide gas uh, to India in the future, there will be some time before we can see actually transport corridors being built from Russia to India. But even in that scenario, Central Asia will be important. So Central Asia geopolitical will, geopolitically will be at a very important position. And I think that economically, in the future, in the long term, over the next two, three, four decades, Central Asia will see economic growth, will see increased trade activity, will see increased transportation of goods and services through the One Belt Road strategies. And therefore, Central Asia, Central Asia will have an important period and actually be an important in an important position uh, in the future coming years. So that is fundamentally uh, what I think is important to look at. In terms of infrastructure projects, uh, well, of course, the Meridian Highway, which is going to be built from Western Kazakhstan to Eastern Belarus, uh, will probably be delayed because of the challenges now currently faced by Russia with the COVID-19. But the ability of Russia to use its geostrategic thinking in terms of how Russia utilizes its geography, both internally and thereby also links up with Kazakhstan and links up with Belarus and thereby Europe, shows that Russia's unique location geographically, which stretches from Europe across Asia, is actually very interesting. And therefore, we will also see, I think, in the coming next 10 to 20 years, Russia being an important player in linking geographically and strategically China with Europe. So those are some initial key thoughts I think I wanted to reflect on. But again, fundamentally speaking, COVID-19 will cement and strengthen China's One Belt Road strategy for the future. Thank you very much. Uh, dear Arne, let me thank you for such a high quality and insightful overview of the geopolitical situation and changes in the world. Uh, the format of today's meeting calls uh, for comments after each speaker. So let me give the floor to Raman Vakulchuk, Senior Research Fellow at NUPI, and he will share his vision on the session's topic. Raman, you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Nargis. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Yermek, the whole team that you organized this important event. Um, and uh, I'm also very much uh, grateful for the opportunity to speak to this very important topic. Um, well, a few comments from me. Uh, I think it was a good introduction by uh, Arne. And uh, I share uh, his vision in terms of the uh, well strategic importance of the Belt and Road projects in um, Central Asia. Although I would say that in the short term perspective, actually there are quite a number of risks that may, to some extent, shape the future projections of the uh, existing projects as well as potentially new projects. And uh, but first, I would like to say that what we also see uh, in um, geopolitical terms, what was happening before the pandemic. Actually, over the last years, uh, one can trace that, and this is what also we're doing in our study um, at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, we have seen that actually the Belt and Road Initiative of China has triggered interest from other big countries to the region. And actually, uh, many different uh, economic indicators show in terms of trade, in terms of the uh, economic cooperation, we see that actually uh, such countries as the United States, uh, Russia, also the EU, have become more increasingly interested in the region. And one can see this development actually uh, after 2013. At the same time, uh, China has been steadily also developing its infrastructure projects, but uh, they have not really been uh, in terms of uh, kind of after 2013, we should say that they've been very much on the rise before 2013. So I wouldn't say that there has been a very drastic or rapid increase in Chinese project in the region, but 
uh, I would say the positive development for Central Asia is that, as I said, it triggered some more interest from other uh, big uh, and important uh, countries that has resulted in some more economic cooperation in the region. And of course, now with the COVID, I think that uh, although there has been a very uh, positive trends in terms of the Central Asia uh, connecting to the world through globalization, I think now uh, for some time, and of course here we have to distinguish between uh, the period when uh, Central Asia can be back on track, it can be back to the normal situation. Uh, but I think that uh, given the fact that many of the global geopolitical alliances at the moment, they are in a very shaky position, and we we hear many commentators and experts talking about how the future geopolitical alliances will look like. So there might be some changes, and I'm not sure that that on this global background, Central Asia will be central. So I think it will uh, take some time before, for example, China will tackle some of the mounting diplomatic pressure for how it has handled, for example, the pandemic uh, in, uh, domestically. And we see that while well, there's an in increasing uh, opposition uh, from some of the big countries such as India, such as uh, the European Union. So I think probably China will channel most of its diplomatic resources and efforts to try to solve this uh, with, uh, with big partners. Um, and then I think Central Asia for some, for some period will need to act on its own, also in terms of uh, combating the crisis, but then also in terms of maybe not expecting much in terms of the uh, support from other big uh, countries for some moment. So I think it's very important also for Central Asian government to realize that it's a, it's a time to unite efforts uh, and uh, to try to foster more um, regionalization, to try to solve the, the crisis uh, together. Uh, and uh, looking forward, I would say that there are probably two possible scenarios in terms of uh, Chinese presence in Central Asia. I think that depending on the outcome of these big diplomatic clashes and mounting tensions between big countries uh, with respect to the pandemic situation, I think that, well, uh, there's a possibility that China can actually become uh, even a um, sort of, let's say, bigger friend of Central Asia, and um, especially if it's fast to react and to assist the countries in overcoming the situation um, with the pandemic. Uh, and another scenario is that if China then uh, very much on the other fronts, trying to deal uh, with this uh, uh, difficult situation with its uh, partners, then I think it will take uh, quite a while before then we see we can see some more uh, close cooperation between uh, Central Asia uh, and China. But having said that, I also believe, and uh, again, as uh, I said in the beginning, I share uh, Arnest's vision that uh, there will be no fundamental changes for the prospects of the Belt and Road Initiative. The only question is when when this will happen, that uh, this rebound effect will take place. Uh, dear Raman, thank you so much for your valuable thoughts and uh, even forecasts. And today we have also our second commentator. So let me give the floor to our chief expert of the Chinese and Asian Studies Program from the Institute of World Economics and Politics, Anton Bugayenka. Dear Anton, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. You can uh, tell me uh, just a sonologist because it's a very long thing. Uh, so, uh, actually my report has a lot of uh, connections with this topic, so, and uh, my session is number three, so I will tell the, uh, my arguments later, but here I want to have, uh, uh, I want to tell a reaction about uh, Mr. Cornelius' uh, report. And uh, the first, I'm uh, totally agree with uh, that uh, um, coronavirus uh, and the lockdown and the crisis do not form a new big trends and it will uh, not a big pivot of uh, Chinese policy in the region and in general too. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's also is watershed uh, and um, this uh, Epidemic uh, will catalyze, will uh, activate the trends that have been uh, outlined earlier in past two, three years. It's uh, how it's said this Mr. Wakulchuk. So, um, 
these trends is a revision and rejection of uh, previous uh, agreements. It means uh, some uh, projects what uh, not uh, don't have uh, any um, interest for Chinese economy first. Um, second, it's orientation on only projects interesting for economy, uh, Ch Chinese own economy, uh, economy development, especially the Western China, of course, Xinjiang. Um, and it's um, also in uh, number three. It's very high level of idealization of these projects. It what uh, what we can see from the uh, from the uh, this Chinese diplomacy activities in the past uh, three months. It's kind of information war, and uh, this American diplomats, this Chinese diplomats, strikes uh, over the world. And here in Central Asia, now we also the part of this is like a world uh, information war. Um, so uh, and. Uh, um, so what um after uh, and for BRI as a sphere of China's influence, um, it's first first one I want to say this um, BRI will stop for not very long period. It's just uh, less than one two years, um, and it's, uh, just because of technic uh, technical problems, it's uh, lockdown and uh, asps, and also about uh, finance resources. But after recovery, BRI starts to be a base of Chinese influence. The world starts to re regionalize, but also uh, split to two spheres. Uh, Central Asian countries will be in in a Chinese spheres of influence, but it will not uh, an iron uh, cotton. Uh, Central Asia, uh, Central Asian states will able to connect with the rest of the world. So the main reason to participate BRI will be uh, 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 for, for China. Um, the main reason to uh, for other states participate BRI, it will be uh, pro Chinese orientation, stronger than before. Uh, before it also like a pro Chinese, but it's uh, like declared officially. But now the China start to look more uh, to uh, some ideological uh, problems, like uh, to say more pro Chinese things. So uh, for Central Asia, uh, uh, Central Asian countries will be more and more oriented on export to China, and it's um, oil, it's ore and metal, uh, China. This market is the biggest perspective market for, uh, uh, of course, uh, as um, uh, Mr. Cornelison said, that's um, uh, that's um, it's, uh, Europe Union economics now is falling down, and uh, only Chinese economy and uh, near to Central Asia is still uh, growing. So. Uh, and Chinese businesses uh, in manufacturing will grow and become to be uh, systematically significant. And China will hold all positions left by Western companies in the mineral and mining industry of they will left uh, if if uh, Western companies will left Central Asia. Uh, so that's my all uh, things. What can I say on this uh, topic now? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, dear Anton. Uh, thank you, dear uh, Mr. Arne, for your insightful speech. Uh, thank you, uh, Raman. Uh, our commentators, I think, could add very interesting insights. And uh, if to follow our agenda, we can discuss our uh, next uh, second uh, session.